And so for me, I wanted, I love big, hairy, and floppy. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right, well, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. My guest today is Stacy Slade with Sit, Stay with Stacy YouTube channel, and I'm going to let her explain that. I have a selfish reason for wanting Stacy on the show today. Um, it'll come out throughout the episode. So, Stacy, welcome. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your backstory? Yeah, thank you for having me, Scott. This is fun. Um, I've been a Washington native uh, or Washington resident and native my whole life. I grew up in Snohomish, Washington. Um, and uh, that's actually how I got my start in dogs was showing okay. 4-H in Snohomish um, as a kid. And when I was about nine years old, I started with my chocolate Labrador. It was awesome. And uh, I I went to WSU. Um and I, I did move away for a few years. I was in Portland, then Ohio, and came back. Okay. And I've been back in Washington State since 2004 and uh, been here ever since. So uh, it's it's been – I love the state. It is one of the most beautiful states in our country. Um, and so when I was in Ohio um, I, after college, I didn't have a dog for a few years and I decided I wanted to buy a dog. And mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of created a list of dogs that I thought were valuable, you know, that not valuable, but that were of interest to me uh, okay. that, you know, I wanted to show or, um, yeah, or own. And uh, that's kind of why we're talking today, right. uh, unless you wanted to tee that up. <laughs> no, go, go right ahead. <laughs> um, is I chose the Bernese Mountain Dog. So I have and, and have been owned by Bernese Mountain Dogs for like 22 years now. Wow. So let me let me ask you, let's go back to that list. What what other breeds were on the list? Yeah. Uh, well, the list, I knew enough in, in growing up in 4-H that you need to find a dog that fits your lifestyle um, and that like a Border Collie wasn't good for me <clears throat> because I don't, I, I, you know, I couldn't take it running and train and train and train and train because those guys need to think and they need exercise. Same with Malinois, same with a lot of those high energy breeds. And so for me, I wanted, I love big, hairy and floppy. And <laughs> that was important to me. <laughs> And I had a, I had my Labrador growing up and I loved him, but he didn't have enough hair. And uh, the golden retriever I had, I loved her um, and she was great. And I was highly considering a golden retriever, a bull mastiff, uh, a Portuguese water dog, a okay. flat coat retriever, and a Bernese mountain dog. Those were my top five. Okay. And um, I decided the goldens I wanted to show. So in AKC showing. And so the golden retrievers are very competitive in Washington state. And I decided I wanted a breed that I could go in the ring and learn with and be successful with, which it's hard for a newbie to kind of walk in there and be successful in, in the golden retriever ring. It was pretty cutthroat. Um, so I, I took those off my list. Bull Mastiff, I decided might be too big um, and then and not hairy enough. Portuguese water dog, flat coat, and the burner were left standing. And I decided the porty probably was more grooming than I'd want. Because you have to, um, like like poodles, you have to um, shave them and um, keep the hair because it's hair. It grows. It doesn't mm -hmm. stop growing. They don't shed an undercoat. Portuguese water dogs don't shed. Um, and so I called a breeder about a flat coat and learned a little bit about the, the breed and the health challenges. And also they're very hard to get. Mm -hmm. And then I called a Bernese Mountain Dog breeder and talked to them about the health the longevity and the temperament. And I decided that was the right thing for me. And there was a little birdie in the back of my head that I have an older sister and we know how older siblings uh, always have an impression on our life. And she had said one time, if I could get a dog, it'd be a Bernese mountain dog. So. So is this but, to taunt her? Then? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I mean, she has her own set of large dogs. She's had a English Mastiff. She's oh. had two, she has two Newfoundlands. So, um, oh. she, she, uh, she has her own set of large fluffy dogs. So, okay. All right. 
So you, you chose Bernie's Mountain Dogs. And then did you get your first one when you were in Ohio? I did. I did. Okay. I, I um, kind of went to a dog show, met some of the responsible readers. And um, because I wanted a show dog, I talked to someone who was doing well with their dogs um, mm-hmm. and uh, ended up getting a dog in Ohio. And when he was, I think he was a year, year and a half, maybe. I can't exactly remember how old he was when we moved back to Washington, but I drove my golden retriever and my my Bernie's mountain dog across the country. I have pictures of them at Mount Rushmore and at the <laughs> teepees and, and the Badlands, all those things. Okay. I, I had a burner, let's see, 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, he was an amazing dog. He was just, his temperament was, was phenomenal. I, I still remember my daughter was very young and uh, they were out on the back patio and he kind of bumped her, leaned into her and sent her toppling over and she started crying. And he just had this look of complete dismay on his face that he could have harmed this, this human being. I just, just somehow that memory just stuck with me, but he was, he was an amazing animal. And, um, so I'd always said, you know, when the time's right, you know, I wasn't going to work too hard at it. I wasn't going to go and just start looking for a breeder and, and, and add, add this into my life. It had to, everything needed to kind of fall into place. Sure. And, um, through an unplanned series of events, it has fallen into place that so we have, um, Bosley now and he will be, well, by the time we publish this, he'll have just turned five months. That's awesome. Yeah. And he's, um, uh, as any puppy can be wonderful and yes. maddening at the same time at times, but overall his temperament is, he's just happy. He's just, just gets along. Doesn't understand why the cats don't like him. Just doesn't quite understand that. And he, he wants them to like him so badly. And they just, we have three of them. Okay. One of them. I don't think I don't think that cat will ever get within two feet of that dog ever. Um, the other one kind of plays with him in a like, if you stand there, I'm gonna smack you in the nose, and 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 he does no claws out, just keeps, you know, it's just kind of comical to watch this. So, the breeder that we got Bosley from, in our conversations, said you should watch Sit Stay with Stacy. Uh, she does a great job of of providing uh, resources to help you learn some things about your, about your puppy. And so, um, first off, I want to thank you because my marriage is still intact because, um, (laughs) (laughs) well, I mean, (laughs) you know, I mean, my wife, my my wife loves this dog. Don't get me wrong, but it was like, (laughs) she's just like, she's very busy. She's having some like, Oh my God, what's going on? You you told me he would be calm and collective. And I'm like, Oh yeah, well I lied to you. Um, but no. And so she has found your videos to be, um, extremely helpful. So, when I reached out to you, it was honestly, it was very, you know, very selfish. It's like, Hey, I want to talk to you because you've helped us out so much. And then, then I found out you were in Washington and then it was like, Oh, well, wait a second. Now we, now we need to take this into the Washington angle. So. I'm glad that they've been helpful and I'm glad that your wife loves them. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. And he's, he, uh, you know, he's, he's going to puppy class right now once a week Good. and, um, he's, he's, they're, He's he's doing well there. As uh, well, last last week was maybe we had a setback, but you know, hey, so far he's been doing well. So for people that might not know what much about Bernie's Mountain Dogs, but I do have first off, I have a question that you're not prepared for. I don't know that you'll know the answer, but I'm curious what you think the answer is. Okay, how many Bernie's Mountain Dogs do you think there are in Washington State? Oh, that is a great question. Mm. I would say. Probably 10,000. That many. That seems mm-hmm. like a, that's a lot more than I imagined. It might be a lot less, but then there's also, I mean, you have to keep into consideration the people that don't do anything and join the, I mean, we have over 2,000 people in the Western Washington Bernie's Mountain Dog Facebook group. Oh, we wow. Have okay. We have 230 people in the um, Bernie's Mountain Dog Club of Greater Seattle, which is okay. a KC sanctioned club. Mm-hmm. Um, and majority of all those people have at least two or three Bernese. <laughs> Sorry, Scott, you're headed probably down a road your wife doesn't know about. <laughs> Shh. 
<laughs> I have a plan. Well, so, so I actually, I'll share this with you. So I'll just, I'm going to share the kind of the backstory, how I, we ended up with Bosley. So yeah. I have a, fr- I have a friend down in the tri cities who has a burner and who is now three and, uh, Otto, beautiful dog. Well, just super chill. They go out and, you know, Otto goes with him everywhere and he's just, you know, just this amazingly well-behaved, just super chill dog. And, um, and I just said to him in passing one time, I said, if your breeder ever happens to have, you know, an opening, let me know. Just, just let me know. Right. And it was just, that was as much effort as I was going to put into it. So I'm having breakfast one morning and my wife uh, comes over to the table and she's kind of fuming about something that she saw on Facebook in some group that she's in about women having to ask their husbands for permission to spend money on makeup. And she was just, just, just not pleased. And she's like, you know, I would never ask, you know, and I'm like, well, it's your money. You do what you want with your money. It's okay. You know, I never, you know, you never, I never ask you anything like that. You know, that's cool. You, she goes, oh, I know, I know, I know. I'm just, she goes, I'm just venting. I said, okay, cool. Well, literally later that afternoon, I get a text message saying, hey, you want to buy a dog? And I'm like, what? And I call him and we're talking. He goes, yeah, the, I just, the breeder just called me and she's got a couple of openings. And if you want, you should call her and just have that conversation. I said, yes, I will. Okay. So got the breeder's number, gave the breeder a call. We had a conversation, left the conversation with the, with the intention that I was going to buy a dog. Cause I was, I was, I'd been ready for this. It wasn't yeah, like I was just were ready. Okay. Yeah. So I go upstairs, I don't know, late afternoon and uh, we're talking and I said, Oh, by the way, I bought a dog today. And I thought her head was going to explode. It is something you want to talk with everybody in the household about. <laughs> no, and I just said, well, if we, okay. But anyway, I said, but I just referenced, I said, remember this morning, you said your money's your money, my money's my money. Yeah. That- and her response was, <laughs> well, not for buying an animal. And I said, no, I know. And if you don't want to, this is completely okay. But I, I do have the opportunity. This has presented itself. And we yeah. talked and she was, she was totally on board with it. But <laughs> it was just funny the way this all came about. Right. So my, my friend, he bought another um, puppy. So he has, he has a puppy that's going to be five months old, same day Bosley is. And then he has his three-year-old. Well, as we're waiting, a couple, another person backed out. It was, this was the time of the, the Ukraine thing had just started and people were getting a little scared and money in the market right. and stuff. And so I was having a conversation with the breeder and she, she mentioned that and I, and I went, Hmm, maybe we should get two. So I didn't say yes to that. But I went upstairs and I said, hey, what do you think about getting another puppy? <laughs> we have one. That's Just good. One. But, but what we're learning is that Bosley's brother's named Fritz. Fritz is a little further in his development behaviorally because he is modeling after Otto. So in some ways it might, it might be easier. I don't know. But anyway. You know, a lot of people have that thought is two is better than one. And what what that equates to is an older dog plus a puppy mm-hmm. is a good idea. Two puppies generally is not. There's something called sibling syndrome where two puppies start to uh, bond more with each other than the people. And mm. they replicate each other's behavior, which usually puppy behavior isn't model behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and in fact, that can ruin marriages. It almost ruined uh, a close uh, friend of mine's marriage because they had two puppies at the same time. And he, it's really hard to potty train two puppies. It's hard to okay. train. You need to train them separately. Right. They need to learn how to have separate lives. So now you've created double the work. Um, right. So I, as a reputable breeder, I don't ever place two puppies with, with any one person. Um, and it's not something I'd recommend. And your wife was yeah. right. <laughs> Yeah, and we didn't we didn't approach the the breeder about this or anything like that. It yeah. was it was just yeah. like oh the two we can, and we have two cats, two brothers, and right. you're absolutely correct. They are they bonded with each other, you know more than yeah. more than it's, more than it's, it's somebody. I mean, I, even I had um, I had Hazy who was who seven months old when her mother had a second litter, and uh, and I kept Frenzy out of the second litter, and um, it 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 became this very sibling rivalry and they were, you know, Hazy was going to put frenzy in her place, which frenzy needs to be put in her place often. And so, um, I ended up, 
you know, having an amazing opportunity with my friend uh, who lives in the Mazama Mountains near Winthrop um, for Hazy to go be a true mountain dog and hike every day and do agility oh. and obedience and all the things. So she took Hazy to allow some peace between the two sisters. So nice. Okay. So you, but the question I asked you was how many you know, Bernice mountain dogs do you think are in Washington in five figures? Well, that's to me, that seems, help me out, put, put this into perspective, put you on the spot. How many golden retrievers do you think there might be in Washington state then? Oh, Just God, to, I have no idea. But, I mean, <laughs> but burners are not particularly common. Uh, you know what? They are more common than you think. Well, they're common on every package for a dog product. They right. are on every they're, single package. They're becoming more popular. Um, yeah, I, it could be lower than 10, but I'm, I go, I, I'm generous. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. There's probably twice that of gold ones. Okay. All right. Wow. So it's not, there's more gold, there's more burners than goldens or what I mean, what I mean to me, there's, I expect you there'd be far more goldens. But I think so 20,000 goldens. Oh, 20. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. What did I say? <laughs> well, you did say 20, but you said 10 burners. That's only two to one. I would, I would think goldens would outnumber burners 10 to one. In this environment. No, um, in this state, because we have okay. colder weather in other, in other states, that wouldn't be the case, but uh, that could okay. be very generous, but um, okay. that's my, there's our, our crack team of researchers will know. Yes. Sure. I would love yeah. to know. In fact, actually yeah. probably AKC could tell us. <laughs> uh, okay. So for the, for the, the audience that doesn't really know much about Bernie's mountain dogs, how about, can you give us a little bit of their, their, sure. of the dog, the breed's backstory? Yeah, sure. You know, the Bernie's mountain dog, it's a breed from Bern, Switzerland. So it's B E R N E S E N is in Nancy. So Bernie's. Um, and we call them burners for short. Um, I will say that a lot of majority of all the reputable breeders I work with, um, we never use the word Bernie. Um, <sighs> I know that some people do. It actually crawls under my skin when people say that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry all if right. I offend any viewers. I Yeah, we don't use the word Bernie. It's Burner or Bernie's or BMD. Um, okay. And... So they are from Switzerland. It's a farm dog. They're a general farm dog. There should be um, their large breed, but not extra large. There should not really be over 150 pounds. I, I 130 something is about where a dog should fall within the standard. So how how big are your three? Deuce is uh, he's named after Clint Dempsey from the Sounders, by the way. Deuce. Okay. Um, I, I'm a huge soccer fan, so that's where that comes from. <laughs> um, Deuce is 115 and he's okay. a champion. He's perfectly in the standard size wise. Um, very nice Bernie's, um, Chase is on the smaller side. She's 89 pounds. Okay. Um, also she's a grand champion versatility dog within, um, AKC. And then, um, frenzy is 94 pounds. Mm-hmm. Okay. And she's two. So, so that probably gives up. everyone a little bit of a, a, you know, an idea. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. about my, my girls have fit everywhere between, I mean, Chase is the smallest one I've ever had at 88, 89. And then most of my boys never hit over 120. Okay. Uh, I keep them lean. That's really mm -hmm. important. And Scott for, for Bosley, you can hear Chase barking in the background. <laughs> uh, it's really important to keep these guys lean. Um, mm -hmm. so their joints don't have extra weight on them. So you should be able to feel ribs easily. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Bernese mountain dog is a general farm dog. And, uh, eventually they evolved into pulling carts down from the mountains, uh, of cartons of milk, um, mm -hmm. big metal things in Switzerland down to the towns. And, uh, so that's how the carting and the draft, uh, piece of what they were bred for comes into mind. And so, when someone's researching a breed and hears that, they should think, oh, it's a carding dog. They pull things. They like to pull. So this is a breed that is strong. They use their core mask to pull. So mm -hmm. training dog, training them and uh, giving them boundaries and uh, having leadership with them is important. Okay. Um, they're big. They're, that little, cute little puppy that you have is probably 50 pounds right now. He's going to double that weight in about mm -hmm. six months. And mm -hmm. what you're doing now will build him up for success later. Um, and mm -hmm. the cute behaviors I think are cute now at 50 pounds. They may not be so cute at a hundred pounds. <laughs> he, he, well, luckily, like I said, I've, I've gone through this once before. Right. So, uh, but he's exhibiting some of the same similarities. He, 
Uh, does well, let me ask you this question: Does the breed think they're lap dogs? Yes. There's no See, such so, thing as personal space with the Bernese Mountain Dog. Right. So he, you know, he thinks he's a lap dog at, yes. you know, 50, 50 ish pounds. And he'll probably think he's a lap dog at 100 ish pounds. And my lap won't, you know, my wife's, my wife will be like buried. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have lots of photos of being buried by Bernese. I'm going to, the way I'm going to die, Scott, is I'll be buried by Bernese Mountain Dogs. <laughs> okay. Well, at, least, at least you got that figured yeah, out. I know. I know. It's at, least, happen. at least you know. All right. <laughs> So, you know, let's just, you know, 100 to 120 pounds. Let's just, that that seems like a reasonable yeah. range to work with here. Okay, so these are, you know, they're not, that's a big dog. I mean, let's let's be real. But that's not a huge, you know, breed. But now the other thing that I think people that don't know much about Bernese Mountain Dogs believe is that they don't shed, that there's no, yeah. there's no, no shedding. Um, I'm kidding. Um, they shed a lot. They shed a lot. And so here's here's the deal on the shedding thing. Majority of dogs shed, and even dogs that are hyperallogenic shed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, some, I guess I'll say hypoallergenic means that they don't shed the, um, I think, dander. Mm-hmm. But majority of all dogs shed, and if you're bringing a Bernese Mountain Dog into your house, you have to be prepared for the hair. And... If you aren't prepared and don't understand what that means, go to someone's house before you buy a puppy to see what that hair means. Um, and and be, it's not the dog's fault. It's part of it. Now, there are ways to manage it better than others. So, for example, mm-hmm. my dogs, I, you know, I obviously groom dogs, so too, but my dogs get a bath every four to six weeks and I have a grooming table and I have a dog dryer and that dog dryer gets all the dead coat out after I bathe them. The hair doesn't come out in the bath. The hair comes out from the drying. Okay. So it is, it's a challenge for, for a lot of people to bathe their own dogs. Um, but it is something that, um, I recommend doing, especially if you have more than one, um, and learning how to use a dog dryer. And I have on sit, stay with Stacy Slate on YouTube, I have grooming videos on how to trim the feet, how to trim the ears, how to blow the coat. Um, mm-hmm. and so that gets rid of a lot of the dead coat and that helps turn the coat over. So when you see a dog that starts to push out tufts of hair, to me, that's a dog that hasn't been bathed or, or blown dry for a couple months. And so you could mitigate that and get, so you don't hit that stage. Now they all, well, the girls generally twice a year blow all their coat. The boys Mm -hmm. tend to roll it or shed out maybe once a year, depending on the climate too. And so, um, you can use an undercoat rake. Uh, and Scott, if you don't have one of those, I'll, I'd be happy to share with you the link, but it's, yes. I use a uh, undercoat rake and it's not a Ferminator. It does not have a blade on it. It's just tines. Mm-hmm. Um, and there it's a, um, Greyhound cones makes a really good one that I like. Okay. Um, but those, that's the best grooming tool you can have for Bernie's mountain dog. Okay. Let's go back to four to six weeks. You're bathing your dogs. You have three of them. Mm-hmm. Are you doing this all in one day or do you, no. or do you like to stagger the fun and do this? You know, yeah, I mean, how do you... it, take, it doesn't take me long because so I have a booster bath and so I have an elevated bath outside and I just moved to a new house. So I'm having a plumber come out to figure out how to get warm water outside. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't bathe them with cold water year round right now in the summer. It's okay, but not in the winter. Um, okay. So I have a booster bath. It takes me 15 minutes to wash a dog. Uh, and okay. I'm down to, I mean, I've been doing, I, I wash other people's dogs that I show. So I, I groom a lot of dogs. Um, All right. and then it takes, it, it is a good hour, hour and a half of drying because you want to get them completely dry so they don't get hot spots. An which hour is, to an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. In less than an hour to an hour and a half, walk me through. What does that look like? <laughs> um, in less than is you still got to wash them. You still got to dry them. I mean, honestly, I, I, I can't recommend not drying them fully because they can get hot spots and infections sure. on their skin. Right. Um, no, we don't like that. But my dogs go swimming and dry off and don't get hot spots. So okay. I'm sure that you could, but that, but you're also drying them to get the dead coat out. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you, do this hour to an hour and a half, is this active drying time mm-hmm. or is this keeping, Okay. Yeah, no, wow. it's with the, the it's a hose, and you're getting the dead coat out and working the coat and, and combing it out. Okay. But I will say Chase, who has a shorter coat than Deuce, doesn't take as long. 
Okay. Wow. But it's still it's still an it's still a dedication to time, and you know you could probably get away with it every two months. Mm-hmm. So and but, people take their dogs to groomers. Mm-hmm. Um, but are groomers taking that much time to dry them out? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They are. A, a good reputable groomer. Right, and and one, and that uh, brings up a lot of problems that some people have is so temperament on Bernie's Mountain Dog. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, we've talked well. We've talked a little bit about um, how amazing they can be and mm-hmm. they're loving. Uh, they are. They can be. They can be a great family dog. They can be an amazing dog to own and have. But there's also kind of the. Uh, I want to say the ten to twenty percent. I hope it's not that high of dogs that um, don't have great temperaments. And Mm. the better breeder you get your dog from, the breeder that's doing things with their dogs and breeding good temperaments and proving that they have good temperaments by doing obedience and agility and dog showing and therapy dog or anything with their dog that proves their dog can function outside the home and in the farm Mm -hmm. is good Um, and with other people around. Um, But sometimes, just like humans, we all have variations of personalities and temperaments. And so um, it's important to set your dog up for success. Anything that you want them to do, you need to show them what it looks like before you force them into doing them. And I don't I don't I say force uh, kind of as a not meaning force because you don't want to force your dog because that's where. Anytime you force a Bernese mountain dog, this is a working dog. This is not a golden retriever. You force a Bernese mountain dog, you lose their trust. So there's there and there's a distinction of forcing and fear. I would never force a dog if they're fearful, mm-hmm. because all you're going to do is make that dog go way more fearful. If you're like I have a stubborn streak in some of my dogs that. They may not want to do something. And I I will be like, I win this. You're going to do this. And it's not a scary thing. They're just not wanting to. Like, for example, Frenzy doesn't like to get up into the bathtub. She's okay. fully aware of what's going to happen. She's not scared. She is, that dog has never been scared of anything in her life. And she just, won't, just doesn't want to do it. So right. I do make her do that. And I okay. win the battle. But I would never force a dog who's fearful. Right. Right. No, that seems... So I think with grooming and with anything you're going to anywhere you're going to take your dog in a crate flying anything that could be different Mm -hmm. show them what it looks like and practice it right no that's great advice sorry we got into the training part (laughs) no 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 this is this This is is my passion no this is this is awesome well let's 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 go down this road a little differently so your your youtube channel yeah what was the motivation to to start this? Yeah, it was. It's a modest channel. It's it's humble um, in in size, but it's it's impacted for your, a lot of people. For example, yourself. That uh, what I I set out to catalog and kind of um, capture the process that it took me to get Chase into the cart. So, for example, talking about showing what a dog what it looks like. Chase was scared of the shafts on the cart because the shafts are static. And so this cart followed mm-hmm. around and she was having none of it. And <clears throat> you can't force them because, again, right. if you force them, then you got a dog in fear. A dog can't think when they're in fear and they can't enjoy what they're doing. So you have mm-hmm. to take a step back and it's called training. And I, I learned through my friend Ruth in the Missama Mountains. She's a draft judge. Is We took it off little bits at a time and introduced different parts of it. Like she ate her meals within the shafts for a long time. And then she ate her meals and then the shafts came up. A little bit and then they went back you know and then they touched her so it's just these small increments and i catalog that in videos and um and it, it, at first when i started doing this and i think a lot of us that start doing something like this and put ourselves out there i was like oh gosh i'm not you know i'm not i'm not a trainer in the world like i'm not certified i've just been doing this my whole life you know i've got 30 years right. of experience but yet to put something out there of this is how i do it i all my first videos are like if there's so many ways to do it you don't have to do it my way you know i was qualifying qualifying and I got so much feedback that people really enjoyed watching them and learning from me. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? It is what it is. I'm putting myself out there and people can choose to do it or not do it. I'm not saying this is the only way. Well, I mean, I think 
a lot of times with 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 any topic when you're watching an, an you know an expert doing something if somebody comes across and they're not intending to necessarily do this, but if somebody's coming across as like, well, these are my credentials and I do all these things, da, 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 da. it almost seems daunting that can I do this because this person has this, this, you know, this platter of certificates. Whereas if somebody's just can break it down so that the novice can have a little bit of confidence and, and build on that with a little bit of success. And I think that's one of the things I, I like about your videos is that they're, um, they're approachable. They're not, they're not, um, not overwhelming or intimidating in the sense like, Oh, I'm never going to get him to do that. You know, or I'm not going to be able to do yeah. model the that. dogs are not perfect. <laughs> My dogs don't <laughs> have perfect behavior. That is for sure. But we work on making it better behavior. And I think right. I share, I like to share how I approach this and majority of the times it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And you know, and I think that's the thing about with dog training is there are many ways to um, get a result. And this is the way I'm choosing. And, you know, if if somebody else has a different method or they want to find fault with mine, that's totally fine. Like I everybody does. And like I, I've watched some of my videos and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But so it's been actually a really good learning tool for me as I learn. Mm -hmm. I can see myself and I'm like, Oh, I'm doing something there I don't like. And so I can modify that. But yeah. And, and you know, nobody says anything mean on the internet. So I'm, you know, no, nobody. well, you know, it's interesting. Every once in a while I'll get a comment about, well, you should have done this and this and that, or, or you know, like I use string cheese for training and somebody has mm -hmm. an opinion that you should never give your dog cheese. And I'm like, that's great that you have that opinion, but I've been doing it for 30 years and no adverse effects. And everybody I know that trains dogs uses string cheese. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, everybody has an opinion, I think is what you learn when you put yourself out there on social media. So, but still, Okay, I can sit and talk all day long. And yes, we have the cameras rolling right now. But I don't publish the videos of these things because I don't really want to see myself on a, a screen on YouTube. <laughs> you look fabulous, just, um, thanks. The checks in the mail. The The point, though, is that I, I'm like terrified of being on video personally. It just it's absolutely terrifying to me. So whenever somebody has the courage to do, you know, YouTube or TikTok or whatever, I'm always like, so how'd you get started? I mean, those first, those first videos were probably rough for you, both from a, how do you get it started? You know, I mean, like everything's overwhelming when you're learning something new, right? Mm -hmm. But you persevered. And how many videos do you have now? Gosh, approximately? you know what? I haven't looked for a little while. And, and be, to be honest, all transparency, I haven't put too many videos up this year with moving. Um, I think I have mm -hmm. over, I want to say 200 to 260. Um, okay. I, you know, I think. So a large catalog. A large catalog and, and the beginning ones were rough. And I have a cousin who works in tech in San Francisco and he wanted to use my channel as a beta for something. And, and he goes, okay, we're going to start this call out. Just, we're going to give you a mulligan, turn your, your camera horizontal. It's YouTube. It's a horizontal format. <laughs> just, I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I but mean, yet, if you want to do it on Instagram, you got to turn it vertical. I mean, uh, what do you right, do? How do you right. win? Well, TikTok, well, and somebody at some point, like you need to get on TikTok. There's not a reputable breeder that's doing um, good videos on TikTok. And, and that format is horizontal. And I'm like, I can't mm -hmm. do both. I just, I'm going to do one thing well, instead of. Well, I mean, you, you could, add, there's, there's ways to add, not that we want to go down to the technical challenge, but there's ways to take your video from a horizontal format yeah. and turn it into a vertical format. But again, how pretty much, straightforward. You how could. much time do I want to spend? <laughs> well, so that leads to, I mean, this is something I hadn't probably prepared you for. And I haven't looked at this, so I don't know. Are you, are you trying to monetize the channel at all? Do you have? It monetized pretty quickly. Um, it did. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's modest. It doesn't bring in much at all, but um, I did pretty but, quickly in COVID. It, it was very, um, when COVID hit, it monetized incredibly quickly because everybody went out and got dogs and everybody was home to train their dogs. Um, mm. And I, that's actually, that's actually when the channel took a turn to be more educational about the breed and about how to own a Bernie's mountain dog, not how to just mm. train. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you that that's been the most um, impactful part of the sit stay with Stacy Slade is to have to to help people find reputable breeders 
um, mm-hmm. because that is a passion of mine. And this breed, so we've talked about some of the good things about the breed and the shedding is negative, but it's part of it, um, is that this breed also does have some health challenges. The, the mm-hmm. longevity of the breed is seven to nine years. Um, yeah. And it, it's important, especially with this breed, to get, from a, re- get a puppy from a reputable breeder. And, when, and a lot of people hear that and they're like, yeah, I want a reputable, I'm a reputable breeder. But they have no idea how to find one. They have no idea what that mm-hmm. looks like. What does that mean? So I tried to put some basic um, building blocks up to, for people to understand what a reptile breeder means. And right. within that definition, there's still some variability. But mm-hmm. we, the biggest thing that I share is that if you own a Bernese Mountain Dog, you should know about the health database called Burner Guard. And it's mm-hmm. burnerguard.org. I'll spell that. B E R. I'll put it. Oh, just, okay. Oh, perfect. Sorry. I, no, you're going to spell it, but I'm going to put a link to it. So would no, you, I shouldn't go ahead spell and, it I'm, because I learned from one of my videos I can't spell on the spot. And I okay. So it. we're going to put a link to Burner Guard. <laughs> There'll be a link to Burner Guard and for people to, to, because it is an amazing resource. It's kind of overwhelming, frankly. But It is overwhelming, but as a breeder um, and someone who looks for health clearances on any dog I'm going to breed, that's where I go to. And the database is there for everyone. It's free, mm-hmm. not just to look at, but to use. So Bosley should have his own profile in Burner Guard, and he should have photos up there. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you were doing any health clearances on him, you put those in there for your breeder mm-hmm. to have that resource so, to understand what they bred. So, right. for example, all of my puppies, there. so Frenzy's litter turned two yesterday on July 1st they will all go get their hips and elbows x-rayed. So I know what joints, um, what joint health I'm producing in my litter. They're not being shown. Two of them, I, well, one of them, whatever. If they show or not show, it doesn't matter. It's the Mm -hmm. genetics of what I'm producing. Right. So for the audience, what are some of the, the, the health issues that this breed has? So the, the breed, Sadly, the immune systems in Bernese Mountain Dogs are pretty um, sensitive. So if, if there's a do- disease in dogs, it seems like we can have it. Um, the biggest is joint disease and cancer. So dysplasia, mm-hmm. so hip and elbow dysplasia. So the very basics on buying a puppy is to make sure the parents have clean and and uh, good uh joint formation. So OFA, Orthopedic Foundation of America, is the only registration registry with, and then there's also pen hip for hips, but OFA is the the main general one everybody uses to get a clearance on the hips and elbows. Mm-hmm. If a dog doesn't have a clearance on hips and elbows, it's a conversation I'm having with the breeder. Why are you breeding this? And let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I could go down a rabbit hole there, but that's probably all I'll say on the, the joints is that it's really important to me to produce a puppies that can be puppies and that people aren't having to get elbow or hip surgery at a year old because their dog can't walk. It happens frequently in this breed. So yeah. um, finding the right breeder that is breeding for health is important. And I, and, and the caveat with that is this is, a, this is an animal it's genetics. That doesn't mean I could do all the right things and breed an excellent right. to an excellent or excellent to a good and still get a dog that has dysplasia. But mm-hmm. what you'll get from me is lifelong support. You'll get the education I have. If I don't know the answer to something, I have 200 other breeders I'm friends with that I can get the answer pretty darn quick. Nice. And so I'm a resource. So that's the joints. Um, temperament we've talked about is also coming from a good breeder. And if you have a dog that has a challenging temperament, that good breeder will give you help and resources and uh, mm-hmm. be with you every step of the way. Um, the other health issues, cancer, um, seven to nine years old, these dogs tend to die of cancer young. And uh, we do a lot of research. So Burner Guard goes back into that. Um, whenever I've had a dog pass from histiocytic sarcoma, which is the, they call it the burner cancer, unfortunately, um, I submit tumors and blood to research. And so we are constantly trying to figure out how to breed away from histio, as what we call it. Um, and we're mm-hmm. getting there. We have some preliminary genetic um, uh, information that we're using. Okay. Um, and then heart, 
I, you know, heart and eyes are something people like to, um, like, ah, it's okay. I don't have to worry about that. We have heart disease in this breed. Subaortic stenosis, SAS, is um, uh, a disease that is devastating. A dog can essentially die at two years old because her heart stops. So making sure that the parents of your dog do not have a clear heart. Eyes, mm-hmm. there's cataracts, good eyes cleared. So those four things are really important to me. Um, there's some other genetic tests of de- degenerative myelopathy that affects a very small percentage of Bernese Mountain Dogs. But if it's in the line, I'd want to know about it. Again, right. decision making on about a pedigree. And that information's in Burner Guard. So like if I have like one of my dogs had a grandparent that had degenerative myelopathy, that will be in the health um, portion of that dog's going down that rabbit hole of searching through the pedigree. So if you ever have done like ancestry.com or anything like that, <laughs> that's, that's what I was just thinking. It sounds yeah, like <laughs> that's what this is. And you can, you can just kind of spend some time and finding out like health. I mean, we reputable breeders, we're putting in what our dogs are dying of and what age. So Scott, right. you could go in and look at Bosley's grandparents. Ideally his parents are both still alive. So he's super young, yep. but yep. grandparents and great grandparents, you can go see, what age they died and what they died of and and i'll be honest i've been in this breed for 22 years those things are important to see because they do come Uh, back Uh, one of the things that i just you know not i I tend to try to keep the show you know relatively on the 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 brighter shade versus going (laughs) negative no 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 no. but one of the things like i no no this is fine but one of the things i i you know i just have this thought is like you know seven to nine years isn't all that long. And when this little guy is changing so much every day, it's like almost like slow down, you know, just slow down. Don't, don't grow up so quick, you know, because it just means time is passing, which is really silly of me to think that time isn't going to listen or time's going to listen to me. Right. But you know, he literally changes every day. It seems like, and he's just growing. I mean, he's just, he doesn't look like a puppy anymore. He's got a, a very, um, his, his well his face looks mature now right you know he's got he's getting that the blocky head he's getting that kind of the the deep dark eyes and he's he doesn't look like a puppy i was looking at photos the other day and i was like he started to look like a teenager that? yeah i mean he's yeah he's kind of got that gangly you know he, he's yep. he's got some coordination issues and yeah, he's growing into himself but well, you know that's it's a good point. And it, what is it? The, the days are long, but the years are short. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great way of looking. And I, you know, something I always tell people is like half the time I can't remember puppy antics because they grow up so quickly. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you, a lot of people are turned off by the longevity, um, you know, but we do have dogs that live to 10 and 11 and 12. So it does happen. Um, and it happens more often than it sounds like it does, but it does happen. Um, But what I will say, and this is what I do tell people, and this dog has been, and I get teary-eyed thinking about it, is this breed is wrapped around my heart. These dogs come into your life and they they are a part of it. They are a family Mm -hmm. member. They're not outdoor dogs. They are family members. So if you can't get there in the house, don't get a Bernese Mountain Dog. Um, They are, they're a very special breed they fall mm-hmm. in love with you. Um, and I, I couldn't, there was a point in time where I lost two right in a row, two very special dogs to me. And mm-hmm. I had a, a flash of, I can't do this anymore. And then I looked at Chase, their daughter, and I'm like, but I love her and, and they're my mm-hmm. family. And so it, 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 it isn't for the, it's not for the weak of heart because it, it right. can get you. Um, but that's why you have multiple. And I, and when you get multiple, <laughs> I do say that you stagger by a, by two years. And and the reason right. I always tell people that is that a, a two year old, you're, you're fairly well done training. They've got the idea. I mean, you're, you're training all the way up into that because they're not mature until about two and three years old. Right. Um, and so you continue training, you go to class for at least a year, if not longer, um, mm-hmm. because their brain, like, as you said, Bosley is, you know, not coordinated. Well, the world <laughs> continues to change of how they perceive it, how they look at it and how they um, navigate it. And so what you mm-hmm. 
a lot of people go through puppy kindergarten. They say, my dog knows everything. Well, that doesn't necessarily translate to a teenager, a preteen teenager, and a, a you know, 20 year old is what I'll say, a college kid, is mm-hmm. they perceive things differently. So you have to keep training them in how their perception changes as they grow. And a lot of people say, my dog knew everything. And at six, seven months, they started ignoring me and kind of flipping me the bird and all this. And I'm like, that's the adolescence. <laughs> it's, a, it, it, yeah. it's a thing. I had the best train. Hazy was like, she was my my pandemic puppy. She, I trained her every day. We did all the trick titles. It's A lot of my videos are of Hazy. Everybody fell mm-hmm. with Hazy. And then at seven months old, I'm like, oh, I don't want to sell her out. But she's so just ignoring me. She just, she would walk away from me like, no, I don't want to do that, mom. Thanks. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, we're going to do an adolescent video. And I have that on on my YouTube channel. And, and I, I had to, you know how like parents have to come up with a different communication style for teenagers because what used to work doesn't work. And so instead of saying come, which she was not doing, I would just tell her to down and she loved her down. So she'd lay down Mm -hmm. and I'd walk to her and I'm like, okay, this is going to work for now. (laughs) This is good enough for you. Yeah. I I, I don't normally ask my guests questions that are financial, but I I think this question is probably one that you're willing to answer. I think. Yeah. Three of them. What's your monthly food bill? <laughs> uh, it, it's a lot. And there's diff- <laughs> many different ways to feed Bernie's. Um, raw is probably a great way, but I can't afford it. It's expensive, but it is a great way to feed a dog. And um, it's healthy. I, You know, and in dog, like everything is going up in price right now. Right. It is, right. It's, got, it's a consideration. And I've heard many of my friends who breed that say, because the vet situation, it's very hard to get into a veterinarian right now. And yep. emergencies happen you're waiting and it's Mm -hmm. it's incredibly scary especially if you're breeding and you have reproduction issues it's very scary right now so it is a consideration um you know the finances of a bernese mountain dog like everything else um (laughs) that they are more expensive than they used to be um Mm -hmm. to buy and to take care of and i always tell people if they're struggling to come up with the money to buy a puppy it's really a down payment there's something's going to go wrong vet bills are expensive if you, you know, there's pet insurance out there for, for good reason. Um, I recommend getting the, that on puppies, because, especially if you get from a breeder that you don't know of the hips and elbows on the parents, because you could be right. facing some, you know, orthopedic surgery. Um, but I think that it's, it's important to be able to take care of the animals that you purchase. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, when I bought oh, this yeah. house, I have a little barn and a fa- and little pasture and I'm like, I could do all these things. And I'm like, I don't want to pay for a farm animal <laughs> because it's, you know, it's a responsibility beyond just buying the dog, but yeah, it's the food bill. Um, we go through a bag of food every, I don't know. I want to say every two to three weeks might be like, I, I just have them keep coming. So I don't keep track. Right, anymore. Right. So what, what are you, what are you feeding them? Uh, that's a great question. And I avoid that answering that at all costs. And the reason why, okay. it, well, no, and I'll show you why is, is because they're, every dog is different. And mm-hmm. like I work, I work in healthcare and I ask, you know, a GI physician, what's the ideal diet for your gut? And he goes, it depends on who you are. So right. it, it's the same with dogs. So feed what works, but educate yourself on what's quality and mm-hmm. what's marketing. And I will say the dog food business is a $4 billion industry. Majority of what you see and are buying into is marketing. The, the mm-hmm. um, grain free, the, um, oh gosh, there's I, the puppy formulas, all these things that used to not be. So the, right. what I tell people is, feed what your breeder's feeding for at least a month. It's the only thing you can keep constant in a puppy's life that completely everything else in their life changed. So keep them on the same food the breeder um, fed for at least a month. When you transition to a, to uh, if for a Bernese mountain dog, it'd be a large breed puppy food. Um, I would take three weeks to make that transition slowly. So you don't upset their gut. Add a daily Mm -hmm. probiotic, um, you know, at some point I always add like a green lip muscle for their joints, vitamin C, vitamin D, oh, a what? green lipped muscle, glucosamine classic is what I use. It's, um, green lipped muscle is a, 
Um, it, it helps the joints. It's a, it's a joint supplement. I don't use glucosamine and chondroitin, but you can. It's similar to chondroitin. Um, it's a muscle. Okay. Like green lip muscle is similar to chondroitin. Um, okay. And it, it helps the muscles, or excuse me, the joints. Um, and and then at about five to six months, I use vitamin C to help the um, cartilage in the, in the growing joints um, and fish oil. So those are what I use. Um, as a breeder, there are two formulas that have been, te- have actually scientific testing behind them, which is Purina Pro Plan and Science Diet. Uh, my caveat is, is I don't feed science diet unless a dog has to go on a vet prescribed formula. So unless you're having issues, medical issues with your dog, I don't use science. Diet. I don't love the ingredients. Um, okay. Pro plan is what I have used for a number of reasons. Is it the best food out there? Um, it's the food that works. So okay. there are other foods that are higher um, quality than Purina Pro Plan, but Purina Pro, Pro Plan has been scientifically um, okay. is, is backed with with trials with Purina. Okay. So right. that's the information I have on that. Everything, I just look at how many types of food there are. It's all marketing, oh, it's and everybody comes out with staggering. Their new, yeah, everybody comes out with their new food. I did a whole video on food, and it's it was hard mm-hmm. to do because I don't like to give specific information because what I do may not work for other people, and right. um, it yeah, it's just it's a hard one. And the other the other question I see a lot on all the Facebook groups is, um, I feed my dog puppy and when should I transition? And first ask your vet. I'm not a veterinarian mm, You're not a vet. as a breeder, um, because there used to not be large breed puppy food. Cause again, that's a marketing, um, is I went to adult. And so I had changed from adult, from puppy food to like actual puppy food, not necessarily large breed puppy food. Um, as a, as a breeder, sorry, from three mm-hmm. weeks to eight weeks, I'm feeding puppy food because they are rapid growth. Mm-hmm. Puppy, mm-hmm. regular puppy food is for rapid growth. I then switch or I start with large breed puppy food as a baby. It, either way, it that's that works for the babies. At eight weeks old, they can have puppy food for another few weeks, but I go to a large breed puppy food for a month or two and or I just go straight to adult food because mm-hmm. adult Regular adult food, not large breed, just, I, again, I hate saying this, but the pro, I use Prina Pro Plan, salmon, sensitive stomach, and they all get that at starting at four weeks old and on. Now, what I do, I do mix foods. I bring in a different bag of different proteins and I mix it because nobody wants to eat the same thing their whole life. So I use toppers, no, I use bone broth, I, I put ground beef, chicken, pork you know, different stuff. I am mixing the foods, yogurt, goat kefir. Like I, my dogs get good food and they Mm -hmm. get it mixed in. Um, so yeah, I don't do grain free. Um, that's not, that's a, it was a whole human thing. That was the whole gluten free, grain free. Like, no dogs are omnivores or excuse me, omnivores. (laughs) They, you know, they, they eat meat, they're carnivores. Mm -hmm. And so they're not omnivores, but yeah, it's, it's complicated. It does, it does um, behoove you to research the good brands. There are many of them out Mm -hmm. there. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a subject that is hard. And I also, I've worked with a nutritionist too, because I, I don't know. And I don't retain a lot of that information. I fed raw um, to my top show dog for a long time. And that worked really well for him. His coat was amazing. His, his, they, they, they poop less, they, their teeth are clean, their ears are clean. Like their body just is so much, it's just such a cleaner food. Right. Um, right. I mean, if you can afford to do raw, I would do raw. Um, and I sourced raw many different ways. It wasn't just a cot. Right. Well, so Let's, 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 we've, you know, this has all been applicable to anybody anywhere listening, which is great, but we're always about Washington state. So why don't we talk about the Bernese mountain dog club of Seattle, which is kind of the Northwest chapter. I know that, but let's, it's got Seattle in the name so we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, 
what's your involvement there? Yeah. So the Bernice Mountain Dog Club of Greater Seattle is um, a AKC licensed club for Bernese Mountain Dog owners and enthusiasts. Um, you don't have to own one to join. Um, and it it's been around for 40 years. Well, for, I don't know, I'm 42 years. Um, okay. It is, uh, we hold draft tests. We have events all throughout the year. We have camp outs. We have uh, draft tests. We have burner and brews. It's personally my favorite. I love going to the brewery with my dog. Plenty of breweries in Washington. <laughs> I'm There's looking for good ones in Covington. Well, we don't have any in Covington. I have to go to Maple Valley or Kent or Renton. Or, but anyway, I'm still looking for that. But um and we have meetings, but we have, it's all burner get togethers. The dogs love to run and frolic. We do draft tests. We do um, mm -hmm. confirmation fund matches. We do Mayfest up in Leavenworth. We put on the, the burner parade um, up mm -hmm. there in Leavenworth every May. We have so many fun events for burner enthusiasts. It's a nominal fee to join. Um, you just have to get to know someone in the club so we know who's joining. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, happy to answer any questions. I'm the president of the club this year. Um, I've been a member of the club for, I don't know, probably 15 years. And okay. uh, it's it's a I, what I will say about the club is I have some of my best friends from that club and the people I've met are my dearest um, friends and the people I talk to and work with daily. That's great. You've, you've danced, well, we haven't danced around it, but we, we haven't really explored. See how I work that in? Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, showing dogs. Yeah. Yeah, it we haven't we haven't it, talked about that. You've had a little success, I think. A little success. Um, why don't we Why don't we talk about that? Yeah. Um, so, I, like I said in the beginning, I started showing in 4-H as a little kid, and um, I was pretty terrible when I started. And uh, it, but I'm I'm very, a little kid. <laughs> but I'm very competitive, what? and I started to realize that if I watched the kids who were good, I could get better. <laughs> so um, smart, smart. So my best friend Sarah and I grew up showing dogs together and she likes poodles. I like Bernie's mountain dogs. And, uh, we, we did not have those breeds as kids, but, um, and when I decided to, uh, buy a show dog in Ohio, um, I started learning AKC confirmation and, um, again, pretty terrible when I started, my dog was good, thankfully that helped us, <laughs> but I was, <laughs> I had to learn and, and I'm, I'm a student of the craft. I love to watch, I video myself. I take photos. I just try to get better and better. I'm super competitive. Sports is my other passion. And so with the dogs, I kind of took that mentality and is to try and be better, um, to better myself. And, um, so just through learning and I, I do show dogs for other people. So I'm a handler. Um, I, mainly stick to Bernie's mountain dogs, but I'm happy to show other breeds as well. Generally the bigger, the better. Mm -hmm. And great Danes are fun okay. to show like a, showing a pony. Um, so I, I was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have an amazing dog named tag. Um, he passed in 2018, but he, we, um, he won our national specialty and, and I handled him all myself, did all everything myself. Um, and he, Took a best in show, AKC best in show, and then our crowning moment, which I get super teary eyed and choked up thinking about it. We went to Madison Square Garden in West for Westminster Kennel Club in New York, and he took a group four in the sold out Madison Square Garden, and it was I'll never forget it. Yeah, that's yeah, a small accomplishment. <laughs> Just it was amazing. Um, that's that's crazy. That's that's in yeah. That's I don't know. Yeah, so right. Madison Square Garden cheering for you was, I mean, I've been in sports, I've worked in sports my whole life and seen those moments for the teams I'm cheering for. And it's, it's such a different experience when all of a sudden you get people yelling, pick the burner out in the crowd. You're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's for me. And the guy that's done this, who was a professional handler right in front of me, he goes, you've got some serious fans here. And everybody started yelling, pick the burner. And that's awesome. It was um, it was an experience of a lifetime, not only for me but for many other people that were a part of the the um, the world that was Tag, and he I called him Tagosaurus. He was uh -huh. an amazing dog, and the link that he and I had, the bond. I, you know, 
he's with me always. Everything I do is for him. Well, so he was your dog. Yes. And okay. So I get that. So one of the things I've, I've always, you know, when I when not, so when I think about things is when you're showing, and when I, and this is what I imagine when you're showing your dog, you have this connection, you're with the dog right. 24 seven, if you will, they live with you. They're, 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 they're family. As a handler though, you're taking somebody else's, you're babysitting for lack, you know, for lack of a, maybe a correct statement. So what do you have to do differently Yeah, is it, when you, yeah, no, it, it is an interesting art and it's some I can bond with some it's harder. Um, if the dog mm-hmm. is super into mom, um, it's harder to get that dog, but I'm paid to get that dog to look the best it's can, it can. And because right. I have my hands on so many different Bernese mountain dogs. I mean, I've, I, I mean, hundreds hundreds of dogs mm-hmm. that I've shown. Um, I know how to present that dog to its best, even though it's not doing what I would like it to do necessarily. Um, <laughs> okay. And, but again, you know, if a dog's fearful, it's a no go. And I don't, I, I don't force a dog to do something they're scared of. Um, mm-hmm. And it can be for some dogs if they're not socialized and, and, are shown what is going to happen because somebody a judge is going over the dog essentially and so a stranger is putting their hands on the dog and if that has never right. happened to that dog and they practice so so we practice i have a dog right now that um i'm showing blade uh and he's he's sitting right here on that heart too he uh he's a special boy and uh he actually just came off winning a huge best in show uh, win for him and and then followed the next day with a reserve best in show out in montana and uh wow. and i to make that successful i i kind of i i put what i learned with tag and the owners have been they understood that this was part of it to to get blade to show is he had to trust me and we've built mm-hmm. a huge bond but i has also spent a lot of time with him and and so so that's an interesting question. So when you're handling the dog, are they, are they staying with you or is it, yeah. what's the, what's that look like? Many professional handlers do take the dog for a year or two when people send them out to be campaigned. Now to show a dog and get a championship, you don't campaign it. You bring it to the show and the handler takes it, but I work with them. Mm-hmm. I'm the fun person. I'm the Pez dispenser of food. I make showing fun. It's not, you will do this. It's like, let's do this. It's, you know, you, if you watch my videos, right. it's more about like getting the dog jazz to do something in all of mm-hmm. the training and not, you need to do this because the second, like you tell a kid, it's the same thing. Dogs are like kids in a lot of ways. The second you say, you need to do this. They're like, dude, peace out. You know, I, I'm no, <laughs> I'm no longer interested in doing this, but if you like, right. okay, let's do this. Come on, come on. We're going to do this. They're like, okay, this sounds fun. Let's do this. So that's where the skill and the experience level comes in is I'm, I'm not worried about the showing part. I know what I'm doing. So it's just trying to get the dog to do what I need it to do. So okay. there's a skill and experience level that professional handlers have. Um, mm-hmm. And, but with a dog that like blade came to us as an adult. And so he didn't have the, the bond with, mm-hmm. with any of us out here. He came from um, the, the East coast. And so we had to work hard to develop that bond and it took a long time and we did it as a unit with him. So we had his, his people, um, mm-hmm. And there was a lot of, um, you know, prepa- preparation for him to get to this point. He won the national specialty this year, which was phenomenal. He just won a best in show and not many dogs have won those two things. Like, I think, I don't know, I can count three in the last 15 years. So mm-hmm. it's, um, he's, he's there, he's mentally there, but it's a mental game for them. It's, you know, I, I think, you know, someone told me this, uh, when I was helping them train their dog is, they're like, Stacy, you don't just train the dog. You're telling us what our dog thinks, and that helps us understand what to do. And mm-hmm. I, I kind of step back from that for a second as I think people forget that their dogs are thinking through what's in front of them. It's not just rote memory of they, they obey, they sit, they down, they, you know, it's they do what works. And mm-hmm. so Frenzy has a horrible habit of barking. She barks a lot. In fact, I'm surprised she's not in here barking at us. Um, and she's doing what works. And so I have to figure out a positive method to make that not work for her. And I, I'm, 
80% unsuccessful with that. It's okay. something I'm struggling with. And there are devices like a citronella collar. You know, I won't use a shock collar on a dog. I don't, that's not a relationship I would ever want with a dog is to, to shock them to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm working through that with her. And sometimes it's just me listening to her. I don't, I, you know, kind of like a teenager sometimes. Sometimes you just have to listen. She has a lot to say. Um, you know, <laughs> but I think dogs, anyway, you, can, can you relate with that? <laughs> I, yeah, uh, Bosley's fi- finding his voice recently. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I do think behavior wise is in the beginning. She, when she was a baby, she started barking at me for food. And I'm like, oh no, we don't do that. So I, I would stop. And I make her down. And when she realized I stopped touching the food when she barked, she put the, she's very smart. So mm-hmm. if you're having, I, all I tell people is if you're having a behavior issue, try to think through it, what you're doing to either exacerbate it or not stop it. You know, if a dog is jumping up on you, are you putting your hands up? Because dogs are going for the food in your hands. So are you putting mm-hmm. your hands up and the dog's jumping on you because your hands are up? It's really hard when you have a big dog coming at you. But if you keep your hands down, I found like, I, and I watch that through my videos. I, my dogs, you'll see in my videos, my Hazy and Frenzy specifically jump on me a lot. And mm-hmm. then I had to, it took me a while to realize that my hands are going up. And I'm like, okay, they're following the food. It's a really hard, gotcha. it's hard to change our behaviors, but Dogs do what works and they fill the void. So if they you're not giving them something else to do, let's say you have a dog pacing around the house and stop pacing, give them something else to do. They can't stop pacing because they're filling the void. They need to do something. You know, frenzy barking. If I start drilling her on her obedience and let's go here, heel, down, you know, she stops barking. So she's filling a void that for her, it's filled with barking. Okay. From the dog's point of view, what do your dogs like to do when you're not training them and they're not sitting around the house? Where do they like to go? They, uh, we do a lot of things with our dogs and I, that is the, actually the founding principle for me of having dogs, the dog ownership is my dad taught me, I had a Labrador retriever, my first dog at five years old. You have dogs to do things with. So Mm -hmm. there are some breeds that are, you know, supposed to be little pillows and lap dogs. These are not it. These are dogs. Well, they think they're lap dogs. I mean, once well, again, let's that, let's reinforce. They, they lap, think they, they're, they're lap, lap dogs. dogs, but that's not all they do. And so we hike, we swim. My dogs go to the breweries with me. They get out. They they have a rich life, and I feel that that's super important for dogs. But you have to do it young. You have to get them out so it's not a scary environment. You have to show them what it looks like, um, mm-hmm. and take them places. Do do rally obedience. You don't ever have to compete, but learn. Learning new things for dogs builds their confidence. It builds their and enriches their life. It gives them things to do. There are scent games. There's nose work. There's tracking. There's carding. There's I mean it, any interest you have in your dog with your dog you can do. I mean so there's fast cat which is sprinting a hundred meter dash a hundred yard dash. There is herding sheep. There is agility. I mean, it's just, it's nonstop. And there's something for everyone in the dog world. And, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or help direct people to where to find those resources. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's so rewarding. It's so much fun. And to do something with your dog and to develop that relationship is something you'll never regret. Okay. Do you take all three of them every time or do no. you take one? <laughs> they outweigh me. No? Well, yeah. So does it just, do you go one at a time or? Um... Yeah. If I'm going out like to a park or a brewery, it's one at a time. Um, just be, okay. I learned that lesson the hard way. It took me a while. Some people can. Some, I mean, my dog, so my dogs, the way I train them, I also, I, like I said, before, I ramp them up. I want, I want a fired up dog because that helps me when I show them. I can't show a dog that mopes around the ring. Um, right. So my dogs have some energy and that energy translates into a lot of, um, they're, they're big. And so mm-hmm. like Frenzy has a lot of prey drive. She likes to chase bunnies. And so mm-hmm. I can't have two dogs in my hands when she's trying to chase something. So I have to redirect right. her and keep her in. So one dog at a time. Um, that's yeah. for my own health. And, uh, I do 
I, we, we go out a lot. Um, now I travel with all three, but one they're in crates in my car, a safe way to travel if you can fit a crate in your car. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, so it's, I try and be safe. Well, where's a good hike f- for, for your dogs? Where do they like to go? Where's a, where's a good hike that's, you know, a little bit challenging, but not, you know, yeah, well, uh, they're probably not doing mailbox peak. Let's put that <laughs> Well, you know, and I'll be honest, I mean, moving down to the South, my frame of reference is all north um well, sure, Lord but, hill park well, in snohomish county okay. um was a big one i grew up hiking love that place um walls falls huge favorite of mine as well up there um those those are those two come to mind and i'm i'm close to tiger mountain so i'm hoping to get up there i know like poo poo point and there's a lot in the issaquah alps that are, are really great hikes what breweries are dog friendly that you've been to? All of them. No, actually, they're in Pierce County. They don't allow dogs. It's sad. If the health the health department's listening, you need to change that. <laughs> um, King County and Snohomish County have some amazing breweries. I'm actually actually headed up to Skookum today, up in Skagit County. I think it's Skagit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, gosh, McMinimans and Bothell. That's probably okay. the, Anderson the Anderson School. school? Yeah, oh, you can't mm-hmm. get better than that. Uh, yeah, it's a great place. I love Formula. I my dogs are, see they do too. They're all barking now. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that. They're, they're hearing birds. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they love to go. Um, yeah, I just I think um, Woodenville. You throw a penny and you find a brewery, and I've there's so many good ones there. Twenty Corners, Bosk. Um, yeah, I. There's okay. a lot of places okay. that I love to go. Well, oh, you want to wrap this up? Good brewing, good brewing. Okay, so I want to wrap this up to respect your time. So, what question didn't I? Ask? I know what question I didn't ask you. I always ask people. I always ask people about coffee. So I have to ask you: Are you a coffee drinker? Used to be. I actually cut out all. Well, I drink tea, but I don't. I, I stop coffee. I stop drinking any calories except for um, libations. <laughs> But coffee, black coffee is only five calories. It's, 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 you know, so you were drinking. I was drinking a latte. I, I was drinking a latte, but it was more the money part. And then just like, I I don't, right. I, I don't like to be beholden to things, advice. Okay. So, all right. Well, I got we'll it out. I'm so, trying to be healthy. All right. So what is the one question that I didn't ask you that I should have? That's a great question, Scott. I like that. Um, I think. You know, there's two things I guess I would say, and I don't know if you could have asked these, but um, for anybody looking into getting a puppy, regardless of the breed, um, but specifically Bernese Mountain Dogs, is to reach out to a regional burner or breed club and talk to the breeders that are reputable, that have done, that are dedicating their life to bettering the breed. It's not about money. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a standard I breed to. I don't breed for money. I've, I've spent more money than I made. Um, I support my puppies through their entire life from, from good and bad. Um, and you want a breeder like that. It is worth their weight in gold. And the knowledge I bring to my puppy owners and help them is what you're buying. You're not just buying Mm -hmm. a dog. You're buying the knowledge and experience and the, that I have. And that's what you get with a reputable breeder, someone who's passionate and is going to, who cares about your dog through the whole life of the dog. You may never call me, but you can always call me. And, and so that's, I think what people are missing when they just go buy a dog. Um, And none of my dogs will ever end up in rescue. I'll never contribute to the overpopulation of pets because I will take back any dog and find a home for it if somebody can't keep it. So I think that those things are, missed um when people just want to go buy a dog because we're by got to have it now um Mm -hmm. you know society and so doing your research reaching out to the people in the clubs there's regional clubs for every breed and if you know they're obscure breeds there's national clubs to find the good breeders um two is people source a lot of questions on facebook and get a lot of different answers and I think it's important to find the people that can know that know what they're doing, have the experience, and can guide you in the right way. 
and um, reaching out to your breeder would be the first thing I would always tell people. Um, they mm-hmm. answer a lot of questions on Facebook and you, you see some scary answers out there that um, worry me. But um, I'm, I'm always happy to answer any questions people have. They find me through YouTube, through Facebook, through Instagram, through everything. And um, may not be immediate response, but I'm pretty quick um, I'm helping people yeah. um, and, and getting the resources. And as you found out, I am, it's, it's a passion of mine. I love it. I'm, I want people to be successful with their dogs and I want them to um, enjoy their dog. And I want the dogs to have a good life. Absolutely. So you kind of kind of named the names, but where's the best place for people to find you online? Yeah. So Sit, Stay with Stacey Slade is my YouTube channel. Um, you can message me through there. Um, and I think it's connected to my email. I believe that's how people find me. Um, but on Facebook, I also have a Sit, Stay with Stacey Slade um, uh, Facebook page that you can message me through. I'm on Instagram with sevens BMD, but that's just more my sevens is my kennel name that I breed under. It's a prefix. Um, are probably the biggest places that people can find me that can reach out. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun for me Good. and I learned, I've learned a lot. Lots more to learn, but I learned a lot and that's awesome. So I appreciate you taking the time and I look forward to continuing following you on all, well, primarily YouTube because I don't go to Facebook a whole lot. Well, feel you know, free to reach YouTube. out if you have any questions and uh, you're about ready to hit the adolescent stage. So have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, Bosley will be fantastic. You, you're doing all the right things. So congrats on a phenomenal puppy. Thank you. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.